We're starting the Gospel of John today. Again, it's all part of the current training for future reigning. So we're gonna, we just finished the Pauline epistle. So now we're gonna go into the Johannine or the John's writings. And uh, so this is the Gospel uh, that John writes and he says, so that you may believe. And believe is basically the theme of this Gospel. So a little background, John writes five books, Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation was written uh, from the island of Patmos. The rest of the other four books are written from Ephesus. They're written probably within about a 10 year period from 85 to 95 AD. And John was an old man when he wrote them. It's probably, you know, a teenager probably when he joined Jesus. He was one of the younger ones, uh, John and James. When he joined Jesus in uh, probably 30 <clears throat> AD when Jesus began his ministry. And uh, so if it's 90 AD when he's reading this, add uh, 60 years to that, he would have been, say... Um, at least 75, 80 years old, at least when he was writing. So uh, Gospel of John is the fourth gospel written. 90% of it is information that you don't learn from any of the other three gospels. They're called the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They kind of have uh, a same kind of a view of uh, Jesus, uh, kind of a little different takes, but uh, it's a lot of shared information. Uh, John may have read those uh, Gospels, but he didn't borrow anything from them, so or not much anyway. Some unique things about this Gospel are uh, John omits uh, the genealogy of Jesus, his birth, his baptism, uh, the temptation in the desert, uh, his exercising of demons. He doesn't include any of the parables, the transfiguration. He doesn't do the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Agony in Gethsemane, and the Ascension. And uh, those are all found in the other Gospels. John presents Jesus as the eternal Son of God who offered eternal life to all those who would believe in him. And you see the verb form of believe, which is the Greek word pisteuo, which appears 98 times in this Gospel. So the emphasis of this Gospel is to believe. It's believe. Uh, gospel Jesus preached was that he himself was a life, which is Zoe, and that he freely gave eternal life to anybody who simply believed in him. Uh, so in this gospel, the word disciple, uh, matates, appears 84 times, and it means one who engages in learning through instruction from another uh, a pupil or an apprentice. <clears throat> this is not a technical term. <clears throat> which <clears throat> always means exactly the same thing <clears throat> every time you read it. For instance, it may refer to unbelievers. Uh, these are the curious people who stay around for a while as learners. Uh, even Judas was referred to as a disciple. <clears throat> Judas was not a believer, but he was a, a disciple. He was, Jesus actually chose him, <clears throat> but he, was, uh, he never fully trusted in Christ. It can also refer to believers, those people that are convinced and committed and, and then the, the other 11 original apostles were also disciples, but they were believers. <clears throat> the Great Commission is in effect for the church age. Matthew presents it as uh, make disciples of all nations. Mark says the Great Commission uh, is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <clears throat> and then Luke says, um, he says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures <clears throat> and said to them, thus it stands written that the Christ would suffer, would rise from the dead on the third day <clears throat> and repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you're my witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you to what my father promised, but stay in the city till you've been clothed with power on high. And then <clears throat> look at what Christ commissioned Paul to do. Uh, this would be sort of the great commission in actual action with uh, Paul as an individual. Uh, he told Paul uh, through a man named Ananias, the Lord said to him, go because this man has chosen my chosen instrument 
to carry my name before the Gentiles and the people of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, entered the house, placed his hands on Saul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell off, uh, fell from his eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, his strength returned. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues saying, this man is the son of God. So even though the word disciple doesn't appear in the epistles, at all, the obvious intent of the Great Commission <clears throat> is to preach the gospel, the good news concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And then all who believe in him have their sins fully paid for and sent away never to be remembered by God again. And they are given eternal life by the only person who has it to give to begin with. And he proved it by his own death and resurrection. And that's the God man, Jesus. So in context, the Great Commission is for us to do our part in the making of believers, a category of disciples by sharing the gospel and then baptizing the new believers, teaching them to obey all Christ commanded us. As believers in the church age, we have a distinct advantage over the believer disciples in the previous dispensation. So we, the church, are said to be in Christ, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, saints, having the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit to power our walk as believers. Now, the book of 1 John is all about that walk and fellowship with Christ. It's not tests of whether you've been justified or saved or not. It's all about fellowship with Christ. A lot of people teach it as a test of whether you were saved or not, and that's totally wrong. The disciples were under the Mosaic law, which brought condemnation and death. The church is under the law of the life-giving spirit in Christ, Jesus, which has set us free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. Church age believers are unique. They're unlike any other group of people in any other dispensation. And unless you recognize this dispensational change from Israel to the church, you're gonna find yourself totally at odds with what God's will for you is in this age. Unfortunately, most churches do not recognize this, this, and they teach discipleship from the gospels, from the aspect of following Jesus under the Mosaic law. We are not under the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was annulled by Christ at the point of his death on the cross, he had fulfilled it completely and perfectly. We in this age live under the law of Christ, under grace, in the dispensation of the church. We can no more accomplish the law of Christ than the Jews could keep the Mosaic law, but God gave us his Holy Spirit to permanently indwell us in this age. When we choose to walk in him, that is the Holy Spirit, he accomplished this the righteousness of the law on our behalf. And when we study the word of God, the Holy Spirit uses it to transform our minds. When we walk in the spirit, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service to God as he sets us apart for his own use in our daily living. So we're gonna do a quick study of the Gospel of John, taking the basic principles forward from the end of the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace from the time where God puts Israel on hold temporarily and lays the foundation for a new dispensation, a mystery called the dispensation of the church, which is gonna begin in Acts 2. The majority of our doctrine is in the epistles, not the gospels or the Old Testament, but our doctrine cannot be understood without God's progressive re revelation of scripture. So that as 2 Timothy says, Every scripture is inspired by God, useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. Now, the way this gospel is organized is pretty simple. John closes his gospel by revealing the purpose he has in writing it. So you get a purpose statement at the end. 
Now, Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he doesn't say confess your sins, join a church, um, you know, do 14 backflips or anything else. It is simply to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He begins his book by echoing the words from creation account of Genesis. And we're going to see that today. Just as the first creation was completed in seven days, John uses the number seven to structure his book. For the Jews, the number seven represented completeness, wholeness, a finished work revealing his purpose in the world. Now, the way John writes his gospel is in two parts. The first part describes Jesus' public ministry. It has seven sections. Each section closes with a report on how the people respond to him, either in faith or unbelief. The second part is devoted to the Passover weekend when Jesus would give his life for the sins of the whole world. John records seven instances when Jesus revealed his identity by using the phrase, I am, which in Greek is ego eimi. This is the name by which God had revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am that I am, and he, must, and he said, you must say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. This is why when Jesus would say something like, I am the bread of life, uh, the Jews would go crazy and want to stone him to death because he, they knew he was claiming to be God, and he said that. John records seven miraculous signs that Jesus performed. He mentions that the resurrection took place on the first day of the week, confirming the power of a new creation breaking into our world. So with that, let's get into the text. So here is the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. Now, the Gospel of Matthew was written to Jewish believers, and they wanted to understand, since Jesus was the king, they knew that, of the Jews, the king of the Jews, and he had the authority to bring in the kingdom. Why didn't that happen? Why didn't he bring it in at his first coming? And we know the reason of that was because the Jews didn't perceive Jesus as king and enthrone him. The Gospel of Mark was written to a Roman audience. Mark presented Jesus as the ultimate servant of God, obedient even to death. And the Gospel of Luke was written to a Greek audience, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus as being 100% man, like us, and yet without sin. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, is written to a Gentile audience and emphasizes Jesus as God, the revelation of God to men. As the book of Hebrews puts it, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, after God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days, he has spoken to us in a son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the world. This Jesus is the word, the Logos, the creator of all things, who added humanity to his deity, who comes out of eternity into time to rescue his creation, to communicate directly to mankind, to make the ultimate sacrifice of love for his creation, and what Jesus would say and do would be rejected by Israel so as to make a way for the Gentiles. This was not just the God of the Jews. He was the Logos, the Greek word. The Greek word um, that was used by which the inward thought is expressed. Communication through speech from one intellect to another intellect so as to be understood and made known. God created Adam with the ability to speak and to understand speech. The word is how we know God and how we talk to God in prayer. And this is why we have the Bible, the inspired, inerrant, infallible self-revelation of God to man. And that's why we study the words of the Bible and handle the reading and teaching of the Bible with such care. 
Uh, just a side note here, there's a very popular book. It's out, probably a number one bestseller. It's called Jesus Calling, and it's not what it appears. The true Jesus Calling is only found by reading what Jesus says in the Bible. Don't be deceived by an imaginary Jesus speaking to an immature, non-discerning woman who may or may not be a Christian, who lets her imagination turn fake encounters with Jesus into some kind of a weird religious romance novel. And that's basically my commentary on Jesus calling. People have a fit every time I mention this, but um, it's, it's not something we should be uh, dealing with here reading. In this introduction, we're just gonna have a look at the first five verses of chapter one. The first five verses of the Gospel of John are highly contested by the cults who all claim Jesus is not God. I'd like to do something a little different here just for these five verses to show you how powerful the Greek grammar is for proving them wrong and for us to fully understand what is being said about Jesus in the original language, which is Koine Greek, as written by John and understood by his readers in and around 98D. This is a little technical, but stay with it and see how a, a true uh, expert in Greek grammar uh, takes these verses and helps us to understand what they're actually saying. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In arche ein ha lagos, kai ha lagos ein pras tan thean, kai theas ein ha lagos. In the beginning, and you'll notice that there is no Greek word te there, the article corresponding with the English translation the, but Greek can often imply the definiteness of the object in a prepositional phrase. So within the context, I think we're very right to add the word the here. Uh, the is often implied for the object of a preposition. And here, uh, clearly the author is alluding to Genesis 1.1. It's referring to the pre-temporal existence here of the Logos. In the beginning, the word, notice how your uh, nominative subject there is marked with the article. In the beginning, the word was, right? The word was. The word was in existence. That's just the third person singular, imperfect, indicative of the verb a me, to be, right? Here translated as was. So in the beginning, the word was, or was the word. And the word was, notice again, we're using that same a third person singular form of a me, the word was with God. I think Murray Harris is right in his Egentee commentary to note that pros is frequently used to speak of just close personal relationship among people, and so we shouldn't make too much of the use of pros here, just with or in close communion with and close relationship with is the idea, and so the translation with I think is good. The word was with God, and notice again, with the verb a me, it's like an equal sign. So we have a subject nominative and we have a predicate nominative. How do, how do we know which one is the subject? Well, the subject in such cases is marked with the article frequently. So, and the word was God. So it's, it's kind of a striking uh, language there, right? The word is distinguished from God. The word is with God. But yet the word is himself also called God. And there's just so much that we could say about this. Um, I, I think it, what's very clear is the, the full deity of the second person of the triune God is being asserted here. He is called God. And we can get into all the reasons why the article is not present here. But perhaps uh, we'll just put a footnote here. If, if, if someone is struggling with that, they're like, well, why, why does the article not here? There, there are many different ways we can explain this with Caldwell's rule and uh, sentence structure and so on. But if you look at John 20, 28, Jesus is unambiguously called ha Theos with the article. Obviously, this is, if there's any gospel in the Bible, in the New Testament, that, that is extremely clear about the deity, the full deity of the second person of the triune God, then it is the gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 2. Hutas ein in arche pras tan thean. Translate, this one was in the beginning with God. This hutas here is, of course, referring back to the Logos, right? The Logos who 
was in very nature God, who was in nature deity and who existed from all eternity past, this one was in the beginning with God. You'll notice that John likes to use um, these demonstrative pronouns. And just to remind you, what is the demonstrative pronoun? Well, in English, it's this, that, these, those. So in Greek, hutas, haute, tuta, right? This is the masculine, the feminine, the neuter. This, 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 or uh, the far demonstrative, ekenos, that. So you'll, you'll find that John's style, his idiolect, uh, lends itself towards using lots of demonstrative pronouns where we usually translate them in English as personal pronouns because otherwise it would sound really laborious to have so many demonstrative pronouns in, in English, in an English Bible translation. But we're going to translate real literally here. So this one was, and that ain, hopefully you know that from the last verse, right? That's just the imperfect indicative third person singular of the verb ame translated was. This one was, and we noted in the last verse how Greek prepositional phrases, the object can frequently have a definite sense even when there is no article, right? There is no te there. Uh, there is no article there, but frequently um, uh, the object of a preposition in Greek will have a definite sense depending on context. So this one was in the beginning with God. So the Logos, who is distinguished from God the Father here, is also in himself, in essence, deity. John 1, 3. Panta diautu egenata. Kai korisatu egenata udehin ha geganin. And I, I agree with most English translations that there should not be a period there. That's because I cut and paste this from a Greek text um, in a Bible software program. Panta, all things, right? This is maybe you memorized pas, the masculine adjective all, every whole. Pas, pasa, that's the feminine form. Pas, pasa, pan, that's the neuter form. Here's the genitive pantas. We need to get that pant so that we can build the rest of the masculine and neuter forms following third declension endings. So this is just a neuter plural nominative. It's the subject, all things. Here's your verb. Uh, you say, well, the verb looks third singular when the subject is plural. Why is that? Well, remember, neuter plural subjects, only neuter, not masculine, not feminine. Neuter plural subjects frequently take a singular verb. The technical name for that rule, I love the name of that rule, is the ta zoa treke rule. Right? Literally, that means the animals run. The animals run. It's an example of the rule. Neuter plural subjects taking singular verbs. So all things came about. Right? This is from the verb genomai. You can see a spelling change in the stems because it's an irregular heiress. This is an heiress, middle indicative, third singular. All things came about through him. So this is talking about the Logos, that all the created order, visible and invisible, came into existence through him. Right? Everything outside of God himself has come into existence through the agency, creative agency of the Logos. Notice how the Logos was referred to with the verb ain, a form of ain. He was in existence. He was existing. But these created things, they come about. They, using the verb genomai, all things came about through him. And without him... Right, Choris is a preposition followed by the genitive there. Without him has come about not even one thing. Notice that him, that is, that's the word one. It's not in. In is the preposition, but hase, right? You may, may know hase, mia, hen. Right? Hase, hase, mia, hen. That's the word for one, masculine, feminine, and neuter. So this is the neuter word for one. Has come about not even one thing. Not even one thing has come about, uh, which has come about. Now, not, not even single one thing in the entire created order, visible or invisible, that exists, exists apart from the divine agency of the Logos. John 1, 4. In auto zoe ein. Kai he zoe ein tafos ton anthropo. Translation, in him, of course that's referring back to the Logos, the second person of the triune God, in him was life. And the life, or perhaps that life, was the light 
of men, or the light of humanity, the light of people. We'll notice that we are using very repetitive language in John. We're seeing ain over and over again, and we like that. It's one reason students love John, because it, there's so much repetitive vocabulary. That's the third person singular, imperfect, indicative of the verb a me, right? Translated here as was, was, was. Remember when you have a verb form of a me, it's like an equal sign. So you're going to have a subject nominative right here. Zoe, and, and then, then you're, you're frequently going to have a predicate nominative. You're going to have another nominative that, that completes the idea that asserts something about the first nominative. And that, in this case, it's false. You say, well, how do I know which one is the subject when they both have the article? In such cases, usually the word order cues you off that the first one is the subject. Uh, we'll notice that the first time Zoe occurs, it does not have an article. And then after that, it does. And that is a, a regular pattern in Greek. It's called the anaphoric use of the article or the article of previous reference where you're able to hook the word and say that one I just talked about. That's why I, I suggested that the translation that might be appropriate. In him was life and the logos was life. And that life, right, the one I just spoke about, and that life was the light of people or the light of men. Notice here how we have a genitive attached onto another noun. And, and they, they both have the article. Did you notice that? There's the ta there and there's the tone. It's a very regular pattern in Greek when you have a head noun and you have a genitive attached onto it. They either both have the article or they both lack the article. There was an ancient Greek grammarian named Apollonius, Apollonius, who observed that pattern. And so that's called Apollonius's canon, canon in the sense of rule. So here we see an example of Apollonius's canon where the head noun and the genitive noun attached onto it both have the article. John 1, 5. Kai ta phos in te skatia fine. Kai he skatia al ta u katelamen. Translation. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not understood or perhaps has not overcome it. The alta there is, of course, just a personal pronoun. It's neuter singular because it's referring back to the antecedent, the light, which is neuter singular. Let me note that the, there's so much rich theology here. There's no way I can cover this in a brief screencast of the Greek of these videos. If we, it'd be way too long. So I recommend to you, for further reading, D.A. Carson's excellent commentary on the Gospel of John, or if you want to look at some discussion of various commentary options, I'll recommend to you the website bestcommentaries.com. You can look at some rankings and discussions of those there. So looking back up here at the verse, and the light shines, of course that's from the verb phino, which means to shine, and look at that ending, there's nothing on the beginning, this is just a present active indicative third person singular ending. I know we have some people probably coming back to Greek who are very rusty, coming back to John. So let's just remind, remind ourselves our endings. O, ace, a, amen, eta, usen. Right? Just, it's just that third person singular ending right there, the he, she, it ending, right? And it's he, she, or it because the subject is a, is a third singular, the light. The light shines in the darkness. Why is darkness in the dative? Why is that in the dative case? Because, because the preposition the in is always followed by the date, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or perhaps understood it. Right? There's a problem. You, uh, you can look at the commentaries here. There's a challenge for us in trying to know, did John intend both meanings? Did he intend one meaning? Because the verb katalambano, which is the lexical form there, the verb katalambano can mean to overcome or can mean to understand, and both kind of can fit within the context. So you can see the spelling change in the stem. It's because, it's because it's a second, second aorist, right? right? It's a second aorist, active, active indicative, third person singular from Catalambano. So, is uh, Jesus fully God? Absolutely. Is he just a God, as the Jehovah's Witnesses claim in their translation? No way. You can uh, play this uh, little gr grammar lesson to them if you'd like. I don't think you'll convince them. They think they have their own Greek scholars. Is Jesus the creator of all things? Absolutely. Is Genesis 1 through 3 to be read literally? Absolutely. 
In fact, if you wanted to, uh, you can go back, uh, I can give you a link to all the rest of the grammar. Uh, this uh, gentleman um, goes through the entire Gospel of John and dissects it just like we did with these first five verses. If you'd like to see that, I'll give, I can give you a link to that. Absolutely, should we make room for evolution? No way. Father planned uh, the creation. The Son was the one who created it to the plan, spoke it into existence. Holy Spirit plays a supporting role to the Son as he spoke those things into being. And it was done in six literal days about 10,000 years ago, period. Is Jesus the life and the light to mankind? Absolutely. Can mankind or any other created thing overcome that life or that light? No, not even possible. When Jesus saves a person, can that person ever be lost again? There is nothing that can overcome him. So just an application here as an introduction to Gospel of John. It is this Jesus that John's going to present in this Gospel who brings light and life to humanity. This humanity, the one that rebelled against him, who is dead in their sins and trespasses, he, Jesus, alone is the unique, one-of-a-kind God-man who is the only means of salvation to this rebellious creation that he himself created. He could have simply let us die, be judged, suffer eternal punishment, which we deserve. But God loved the world in this way that he sent, well, you know the rest of this verse, and we will study it when we get to John 3.16, probably the most well-known Bible verse even among non-Christians, and yet few will believe in him, and we'll see why. We'll see in John's narrative concerning Jesus that he came to his own creation because he loved them. But his creation did not love him back except for a few who simply believed and were saved. Maranatha.